today, I'm going to tell you about the only thing that matters in life. I don't know if you came this morning thinking we were going to hear something profound, but when I lay something like that out, it almost sounds like I'm guaranteeing it, right? I'm going to talk to you about the only thing that matters in life, the only real issue that any of us have to worry about or uh, be concerned about in life. Uh, this is not, believe it or not, a message about family. You know, when you say those kinds of things, you might jump to that kind of a, a space that we'll be talking about family, we won't be. Uh, maybe you'll think we'll be talking about politics. That's absolutely, certainly not what we're going to be talking about. Maybe we're talking about wealth. Seems like, particularly here in America, wealth is something that's on a lot of folks' minds. But that, too, is not the thing that we'll be talking about this morning. Um, what we're going to be talking about this morning uh, is blessing, but not about any of those kinds of considerations or concerns. A blessing more important than all of that, a blessing more necessary than all of that, a blessing more lasting than anything that has to do with those kinds of things. This is something that really is the only thing that really matters in life. I'm going to uh, start this morning with a little a bit of a... Uh, uh, an incident, a story that, that is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. And uh, let me read this to you, and then we'll talk a little bit about what it is that's there. Uh, this starts with verse number 2. This is the New International Version of the Bible. This is what it says there. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one that is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. And really, I would say our focus today has to be in that very last verse. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, I think you catch the, the basic gist of the story here. Um, let me just reiterate it um, in case you don't. Uh, John the Baptist is at this point in time in prison. He's, he's been jailed by Herod. Uh, he, had been, he had dared uh, to call Herod on the carpet over the sinfulness of his life. Uh, that's not something that is necessarily a, a wise thing to do when you're dealing with an absolute monarch. And uh, certainly it proved the case in John's life. Herod went and uh, threw him in prison. And from prison... Uh, in the midst of, you know, all that, that comes with that, I'm sure for John it would have been uh, just terribly lonely. It would have been something that would have caused despair. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, the level of anguish that a person would feel in that kind of circumstance. From that kind of a place, John sent some of his associates, some of his very own disciples, uh, to Jesus uh, to ask him so he could be sure that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, he had been sure at one time. We know that uh, uh, at the very beginning of, of Jesus' ministry, of course, was his baptism. John chapter 1 talks about what occurred in that particular event, especially in regard to John the Baptist. And there we are told that John was, was quite certain about who Jesus was. In that moment, he had no doubts about who Jesus was. In that moment, he was very clear about who Jesus was. He pointed him out and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But now, it's some time later. And the situation, the circumstances have changed. And John has, you know, more or less fallen from that pinnacle of, of popularity and, and in, uh, impact uh, that he had at the time of Jesus' baptism to now this time where he's sitting somewhat broken and lonely in a jail cell wondering, wondering. Um, now, exactly what had changed in John's perspective 
to take him from the place where he was so clear and so certain to this place now where he's got to send messengers to Jesus to ask. Um, I, I would say maybe some of it could be blamed on, on the despair of his condition. I think any of us would feel broken and shattered and maybe not quite ourselves and, and maybe not quite as strong in our thoughts as we might have been if we were in a different circumstance. I mean, that's not an easy place for anyone to be in. It certainly wasn't for John. So maybe his own despair, perhaps that was some of the reason. I, I think that probably some of the reason, and maybe even more of the reason, had to do with the lack of messianic action on Jesus' part. Now, John was very clear that, at least back in John chapter 1 at the beginning, that Jesus was the Messiah, but now he has these doubts. And some of those doubts, I think, were coming from kind of the, the, um, the, the party line that all the expected people had concerning the Messiah. The, the, most of the Jews who were expecting the Messiah, who actually believed that he was coming and that maybe he was coming soon at that point in time, uh, a lot of them had you know, perspectives that were near and dear to them about what that Messiah would be like and what he would do. Uh, they were quite sure that the Messiah would come and that he would clean Jerusalem out, get rid of all of the heathens that were there, get rid of all of the all of the interlopers and all of the all of the uh, the, the trespassers that were there. Uh, Jerusalem was filled with with people of the ilk of Herod. Now Herod supposedly was was the king of the Jews, at least from the Roman perspective, but honestly he wasn't even truly a Jew himself. He was he was an Idumean, uh, an Edomite. Um, he was only Jewish by convenience so that he could end up uh, getting some political power and influence amongst them. Um, and there was plenty of people like him roaming about that, that place at that time. And uh, um, then there was the Romans. And the Romans were, of all the folks that would be been considered trespassing, they certainly would have been at the top of the list. Did they belong in Jerusalem? Did they belong in the streets of the holy city? Did they belong uh, in the place where the, God's temple was, where his very name dwelt? Did they belong there? No, they certainly didn't. And uh, everyone who was expecting the Messiah, the first thing that they thought the Messiah would do was just stand up in, uh, in Jerusalem and put an end to all of this, all of this travesty of Edomites and Romans and heathens and and people who are were Jewish but only in name only. They thought that Jesus, if he was Messiah, would stand up and with power and vigor would shake up the powers that be and that would shake up the status quo and would bring a, a renewal of David's kingdom to earth then and there. That's what they thought the Messiah would do. You know, from the time that John baptized Jesus to this time, that's not what Jesus was doing. You know, I would imagine that John probably was patient for the first week or maybe the first two weeks, but now it's months and even, you know, years uh, into the ministry of Jesus. Hence, he hasn't brought down the Romans. He hasn't cleansed Jerusalem of, of all of the, the filth. Uh, and and the, uh, the sacrilege of unbelieving people. He hadn't cleared out Israel as a, as a home for the promised people. Uh, he hadn't done any of those things. And, you know, you're sitting alone in prison. Are you apt to think, I wonder what he's waiting for? I think that maybe John was. So I think that some of the problem that, that maybe fed some of the concerns, maybe we could say some of the doubt that John had, was that Jesus wasn't just not acting like they expected the Messiah to act. It made them wonder, if, did we get the right guy? Well, maybe, maybe it was just the fact that Jesus you know, was uh, walking in a holiness that was kind of out of the mold. A little later on in this particular chapter, down in verse number 19, uh, Jesus, in talking about John the Baptist, mentioned that uh, John the Baptist came and he was a he was a faster. He was living in a very uh, a very ascetic life. 
Along comes Jesus. Jesus is eating. Jesus is drinking. Jesus is hanging around with sinners. And, um, you know, they're calling him a glutton. And they're calling him a drunkard. Uh, calling him unholy. And uh, I wonder if some of that maybe had affected John's consideration sitting in that prison cell. I mean, you would expect the Messiah, right, to be somebody who would at least fulfill the traditions of the elders, to do so with vigor, to do so with absolute dedication. But that's not what Jesus was doing. And so, you know, for a number of reasons, I, some of these things are possibilities that I've laid out before you. I think that John, in the loneliness and the despair of being in that prison, went from a place where he was crystal clear about who Jesus was to a place where there was a bit of fog involved. And that fog was something that even in the likes of someone like John the Baptist did not bode well for. Jesus said, in response to the fog that, that, that the question John had sent to him represented, he said, blessed are those who are clear about who I am, who are without regret about seeing me for who I am, who are not stumbling over the realities of what I'm doing. Blessed are they that are seeing me clearly without doubt and are not distracted by these things which cause stumbling, which cause doubt. That's what Jesus sent back to John the Baptist. Now, that seems like maybe it was an insult or a rebuke, and certainly we can take it that way. I mean, it, it would be easy enough to see that Jesus was applying some kind of uh, corrective to the doubt that John the Baptist's question uh, involved. And yet, Jesus went on to say probably the most wonderful things that could be said about any human being about John the Baptist. He said that he was the greatest of all those that had come up to that point in time. And so Jesus did not have a low opinion of John the Baptist. Jesus had not suddenly, in saying the things that he said to John the Baptist, uh, was in a mind to write him off or to get rid of him or to cast him aside or anything else like that. But in the love that he had for John the Baptist, he certainly wanted him to be corrected. Not because Jesus was interested in proving himself right, but because he was interested in seeing John be blessed. See, the truth is, we all want to be blessed by God. right? I mean, if, if we believe that there's a God out there, the one thing that we would like to think is that he feels good thoughts about us. He feels good feelings about us. He has in his heart uh, a, a, you know, a, a graciousness toward us. We would like to think that if we think there's a God at all. But Jesus was telling us that the one thing that you need for blessing, the one thing, and I would say the only thing that we truly need for, to have blessings in our lives before God, in our lives not only as we live them here and now, but you know what happens after, after this life ends. If we want to have blessings here and now and then, the one thing, the only thing really that we need to have in our lives is a certainty in our heart about who Jesus is. We need to get certain about who Jesus is. Whatever the reason for John's tentativeness, Jesus' response was that blessing lay in being certain about him. Now, certain about what? Jesus you know, said some things to the messengers to take back to John. Uh, one of those things, I think, certainly was about his power. He says, do you see what you're seeing? The sick are being healed. The lepers are being cleansed, right? The, the lame are, are walking. The blind are seeing. The good news is being preached to the poor. Uh, Jesus was basically uh, giving out a, a prophetic resume there, coming right out of the, uh, the book of Isaiah, in a matter of speaking, saying, all the things that demonstrate the power of God in the Messiah are being demonstrated in Jesus' life. They thought that the power of the Messiah was going to be involved in getting rid of Herod and getting rid of the Romans and establishing David's kingdom uh, there on earth uh, in the promised land. 
That was not at all Jesus' agenda, at least not at this particular visit. This was not Jesus' agenda at all. Jesus' agenda was to demonstrate the love and the power of God to affect and to bless the brokenness of life. And certainly, that kind of power was being demonstrated by Jesus. Uh, maybe John was tentative as well um, about, you know, that sense of, of Jesus' humanity. You know, Jesus ate and he drank and he hang, hung out with, you know, people, normal people, not holy people, you know, not people that were full of themselves. He, he hung out with, with, you know, your average everyday slob. He actually hung out with people that were worse than that. Jesus says that, that we can't be offended by his humanity. I know there's people today that will say things about Jesus that kind of make me think they're offended by Jesus' humanity. You know, they, they'll, they'll say things like, well, if Jesus truly was the Messiah, then, then why? You know, why aren't this thing and that thing being taken care of? Why is there wars and why is there disease and why are there things falling apart and bringing ruin to people's lives? Why is there all these tears and there this heartache and this pain that we have in life? And Jesus just walked through the midst of it all. And he addressed some of it, but he didn't address all of it, not even close. And he seemed like he was just as happy knowing that some people in front of him could be helped and other people wouldn't be helped. Jesus never seemed to be, you know, beside himself out of great uh, anguish over the, the terrible condition that existed for the bulk of humanity. People get so mad at Jesus for having such indifference. That can't be God, certainly, only just a man. I tell you what, it's a mistake to be offended by the humanity of Christ. It's a mistake to look at the limitations and the unwillingness to step beyond his, his measure. There, there, it is a mistake to take that as meaning that somehow or another there's room for doubt in our hearts about Jesus. No, uh, there's no place for doubt about Christ. Not, not about his power and not about his humanity. Certainly uh, not about his apparent lack of messianic action. I mean, there, there are, to this day, there are many Jews that, that the one thing that, that really, um, for, in their mind, seals their, their opinion that Jesus is not the Messiah has to do with the fact that, that the, the Israelites are not in Israel dominating their land with the temple in Jerusalem and the city in their own hands. And what, all I have to say to you about all of that is just this, um, that will come in its time. And when it's time to do that, there's not going to be time to do anything else. You know? Right now there's time for things to happen amongst human beings like you and me. There's time for us to consider who Jesus is. There's time for us to think about, do we take it seriously? Do we honestly believe that in that person walking around so humbly, we see the very face of God? Or, or, or do we really seeing that? It, it, we have a chance to consider that now, but I'm, I'm telling you that when Jesus steps into Jerusalem to do the actions that they expect of the Messiah, it's going to be too late for all of those who held doubt in the, in, in the foretime. We don't get to act on the basis of sight. We have to act on the basis of faith. Did Jesus do enough to demonstrate that he was the Messiah? I don't know how anyone could argue that he didn't. Certainly, he thought he did when John questioned him. He sent back to John the answer that said, look, the thing that Isaiah prophesied about Messiah, these are the very things that I've done. So you go and tell John that and tell him this, that the one who is blessed is the one who doesn't have doubts about me. You see, when it comes down to it, the one thing that Jesus wants for us and that he wants from us is just coming to a situation where we've dealt in our hearts, in our minds about who he is, and we've come to a conclusion. 
you know, there's a lot of folks that think that there's something, I don't know, good about holding in abeyance, you know, the kind of decision that would that they would have to make to get clear about Jesus. Maybe in their mind they think that as long as they're not, you know, if they're not clear, that it doesn't really impinge upon their life. I kind of felt that way at one time in my life. I was about 15 when I had an experience. I was at a festival. It was a Jesus People Festival. A bunch of music and all that kind of stuff in a, in a public park. I was about 15 years old and I, I just had this incredible experience. It was God. It was the Holy Spirit. And in that experience, in that moment, I became absolutely convinced that Jesus was the Son of God. You would think, well, that's exactly what you're talking about here, Pastor. That must have been the beginning of a happy story. And I would say, no, it was actually the beginning of misery. It was the beginning of misery for me because even though in that moment there was something that was so clear, and in my heart there was something that was so certain about it, the fact of the matter is I, I didn't want to deal with the repercussions of it. I mean, if I'm going to be certain about who Jesus is, there's some fallout in other areas of my life, right? It means that if Jesus is the Messiah, then I have to think about what he wants in my life. If Jesus is the Messiah, it means I, I, have, I owe him obeisance. I have to bow my knee to him. If Jesus is Messiah, I'm going to have to start following after him. I'm going to have to start caring about the things that he cares about and doing the kinds of things that he does. If Jesus is Messiah, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess up my life. And I want to tell you today, that's absolutely true. If Jesus is Messiah and you come to terms with it, it's going to mess up what you had before. But here's what I would say to you, is that what you had before, could you call blessing? Would you call the life before blessing? Well, you say, well, I, you know, I have friends. I'm, you know, I got things to do. I'm having a good time. Is it blessing? I, I know that, you know, I know that my life before I started following Christ and oftentimes would have the appearance of having a good time. But I tell you what, no matter what you do to anesthetize yourself, you know, you always wake up someplace along the line, not to a hangover physically, but to a hangover spiritually, where the emptiness starts rising up within you and you realize that you've just basically sold your soul, in a matter of speaking, for something that, that really doesn't suck her, that really doesn't satisfy. But where can you find blessing? There's only one place to find blessing, and that is in Christ. And the only way to find blessing in Christ is to stop piddling around and to come to terms with who he is. Um, Jesus said, that blessing exists in this one condition, in this one place, for this one group of people. Blessing exists for those who have no doubts about Christ. I don't know how many people might be in churches today all across this land, maybe even all across the world in various time zones and whatnot, who are sitting in churches and they have doubts about who Christ is. And the doubts that they have about who Christ is are the kinds of things that let them excuse a, a nominalism, you know, going through the motions uh, as far as their religious practice, as far as their religious belief. Uh, or perhaps it's, you know, people that instead of being in churches all across this land and all across the world are sitting someplace outside of a church rather than inside it and they're saying, who needs church? A church is just filled with hypocrites and liars. Anyhow, a church is just filled with, with uh, people who are, uh, who are, uh, no different than people in the world. And I would say, well, what else would you expect to find in church? Aliens? Did you expect to find E.T. in church? You expect to come into church and, and find, you know, Jesus sitting on every pew? Again, there's coming a time when that's going to be the case. The Bible says when we see him, we will be like him because we will see him 
as he is. Everyone that you see who is certain about who Jesus is is going to be just like Jesus. I'm looking forward to that. I, I, I've come to like Jesus. I like who he is. I, I like the cut of his jib. I like, I like the way his, his mind thinks. I like the way his, his heart works. I like Jesus. And you know, the thought of being in a, in a church where everybody is like Jesus, that's, that is really something that puts some hunger and thirst into me. I guarantee you, though, that that's not going to happen. Not until he comes bursting through the sky. And then it will be the right time for all those who were certain for Christ and they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and for all of those who decided they would ride the fence, right? They will find themselves permanently, eternally estranged from God with nothing but some splinters in their backside for the cost. We cannot ride the fence when it comes to Christ Jesus. We have to make up our minds. We have to get certain about this. And folks that, that are not certain about Christ do not find the blessing of Christ. Folks that are not certain about Christ do not find the blessing of Christ in this life, nor do they find the blessing of Christ in the life to come. It takes one thing, and there's only one issue that matters in all of this, and that is, are you certain about who Christ is? If you're certain about who Christ is, then blessing is yours. The very blessing that, that Jesus more or less promised John, it's not a blessing that can be measured in the things that the people of this world think are important. You know, the people of this world, if you watch, you know, stuff on television or on the internet or whatever, I mean, you know, folks just seem to be fascinated by the most stupid things. <laughs> I remember, I mean, probably in my, my history, I would say the thing that stands out as it being the stupidest thing that I've ever seen in my entire life was, was a program that was on when I was young. It was called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. <coughs> Does anyone remember that stupid show? And I call it a stupid show because that's what it was. If you watched The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, you were not better for it. You were worse. It did not, it did not help you in any way. It just made you stupider. You know, and, and depending on where you were in life, I mean, sometimes I have to think, you know, we're stupid enough on our own, we don't need someone else adding to it. But the world, the world is lost pursuing things that, that do not satisfy. The world is lost in, in stretching out for things that, that don't deliver. The world is, is looking to connect people to a thing that isn't a blessing. They think it's a blessing until they have it, and then they're disappointed. I've got to say that probably every single kind of thing that you can get out of life in this world is of that kind of thing, isn't it? I mean, you strive for it, you want it, you wish for it, you, you do everything you can in, in, to get to it, struggle, sacrifice, sweat, steal, whatever you have to do, and then you get it, and it's like, is that all there is? I guess we'll go on to the next thing. I mean, there's folks that are just like dogs chasing your tail in life. Just keep on going for the next thing because the only thing they have to take their mind off the emptiness is to struggle for going for the next thing. You know, I always appreciate people that can't sit still, that are always active, always doing something. You know, it's a, it's a trait that I in some sense envy. But at the same point in time, sometimes I think maybe it's not such a great trait because sometimes I think that what people are doing is just making themselves drunk with activity so they don't feel the depth of the true burden of happiness in their heart and soul. There's only one place to get the blessing you need and that's the blessing that God can provide. The blessing that God provides is a blessing that feeds now in this moment and feeds your life and then feeds into eternity. The blessing of God is something that can take a broken heart and help it heal. The blessings of God are the kind of thing that can take a messed up life and put it back on course. The blessings of God are something that can take a useless life and make it a blessing to others. See, the blessings of God are just this incredible thing that 
that if you've ever seen somebody who's come to terms with certainty about who Jesus is, and they've, they've just given themselves over to it, that the incredible change that is possible in their lives, the incredible power that can come upon them to make a, a positive difference for good in the lives of others. If you've ever witnessed the, the, the incredible ability to overcome things that have seemed so entrapping and so, so, uh, so much the source of bondage to a person, these things fall aside when people come to terms with certainty about who Jesus is. There's only one thing that any of us need in life, and that's the blessing of God. And there's only one place to get it, and that's God's chosen means and method. God has not left it up to us to figure it out on our own. He's not left it up to us to, to each decide our own way to find whatever kind of peace or satisfaction we can. God has sent a word. God has sent a way. And that way and that word is in Christ Jesus. And in Christ Jesus, what he sent is a way to know that your sins are forgiven. And in Christ Jesus, what he sent is a way for you to know you're reconciled with God, that you're in the right place with God, that he loves you and is in fellowship with you. And the thing that Christ has done is to make sure that you understand that this life is not the end. Jesus came out of the tomb. There's life after the grave. And Jesus knows the way there. No one else does. No one else has done that. No one else has done what Jesus has done. Jesus alone has done that. You can't find in anyone else. And so what is the one thing you need in life? What's the one issue that matters in life? It comes down to this. It's just being certain about Jesus. What keeps us from certainty? Well, we can make all kinds of, you know, rationalizations in our minds, some of the things that we've talked about earlier today, even. I don't think that they hold up much. The one thing that I think really keeps us from grasping the issue, the one thing that really keeps us from getting to the place that we need to find <coughs> certainty, is to understand that it's not worth holding on to all the things that we're trying to hold on to instead of certainty. I mean, if you're going to be certain about Jesus, it just, you know, it makes you wonder, what's my life going to live, look like? Am I not going to have, you know, the same activities I used to have? Am I not going to have the same friends I used to have? Am I not going to, if I, am I not going to, uh, you know, be pursuing the same things that I used to pursue? And, you know, the answer to all of those things is, you know, when you come to terms with who Jesus is, it does mean change. You don't have to make up the change. You just come to terms with who Jesus is, and you start following him, change happens automatically. You don't have to change for Jesus, but you will change if you come to terms with Jesus. What about that change is frightening to you? Do you think it'll mess up your friendships or your relationships with certain people? Do you think that it will mess up your career? Do you think that it will mess up, you know, your hobbies? You know, what is it that you think it's going to mess up? Whatever it's going to mess up, I think if it messes those things up, that those things really are inconsequential. We think things matter when they don't. The one thing that matters is getting certain about Jesus. Blessed is he who is certain about me. Blessed is he who has no doubts about me. Blessed is he who comes, has come to terms with the reality of who I am. And that's what Christ is saying to us. Just let me ask you today, is, is, your, life, is your life reflective of someone who has come to terms with who Jesus is and have you given yourself over to certainty? Now, there's a lot of things that will snag you when you're trying to make that stretch into certainty, right? Those little, those little fibers catching on, on the things and yanking and pulling you back. We have to just let it rip. 
There's only one thing that matters here and now, only one thing that matters for eternity. And that is being absolutely certain about who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He died for our sins. He rose from the dead because of our justification. That is it. Well, have, have you given yourself over to certainty? Have you say it's going to do what it does, it's going to mean what it means, whatever happens is going to happen, but Jesus is the one and I'm following him. Have you done that? You know, what are you waiting on if you haven't? Every day that you delay is just another day that life might slip away without you ever coming to that place. The one thing, the only thing that matters, and you're going to let something, let it slip your mind or let it slip away from your heart and end up never taking root in you and therefore never having prepared you for eternity. There's only one way to walk out of the tomb, and that's hand in hand with Jesus. Have you come to certainty?